the director of the uh, Economic Forecast and Development Center is Chris Thornburg. Now, Chris actually was one of those few who predicted in 2007 that the market was going to crash in December. So he understands the importance of looking ahead, and he was there at the time, 10 years ago, that began this, this epoch for us. But before I introduce Chris, I want to stop a minute and remind everybody the name of the center. This is not the Economic Forecasting Center. It's the Eco Economic Forecast and Development Center. These data are, are interesting, if you're an economist, I'm sure, uh, but that's not what's important. It's their utility that's important. So taking these forecasts and thinking about how we can use them to change the future of these next 10 years is really what is at the core of this business. And Chris is all over that as well. <clears throat> Chris has been at the university now for several years. Before that, he was with the California State Comptroller's Council and Economic Div Advisors, both as, as an advisor and as a member of the board. Uh, he's now presently on the board of directors of the California Chamber of Commerce. You'll see him all the time quoted in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. And that's because of the expertise and the insights that he has about the economy. And now that he's here at UCR and focused largely on the Inland Empire, we've got that nationalist perspective drilling down on where we are today, but more importantly, where we're going to be in the future, this whole notion of development. So it's my honor to introduce to you the director of the Economic Forecast and Development Center, Dr. Chris Thornburg. Uh, good morning. Oh my God, that was horrible. Good morning. good morning. Thank you. That's much better. I have a remote control. I have my Britney Spears headpiece on. I think I'm ready to go. Um, I can't believe you're all here this morning. Uh, you do realize, of course, that there's a cataclysm going on, on outside here. And, uh, of course, your 401k is taking body blows faster than Conor McGregor did last weekend <laughs> in that UFC match. Uh, yes, the markets are down another percent this morning. And, and it's interesting that, that this should be happening now on, on the day of this event. You know, I remember 10 years ago having, of course, a lot of conversation about the stock market in the wake of, of course, this mess. So 10 years ago, well, maybe 10 years in a couple months now, of course, was the failure of Lehman Brothers. And that, of course, uh, sent uh, a, a, a massive blow to the stock markets across the globe. And in many ways, we look back on this and, and sort of remember this as, if you will, the, the peak of the Great Recession. And it was funny because on this anniversary, looking back, you know, the over 10 years and, and thinking about this, I, I actually went back to some of my old slides back in the day, uh, back to the presentations I was doing in, in 2008 and 2009. And this is some clips I grabbed from back then. Um, what's interesting about this anniversary is we always think about the stock market as a, as a leading indicator. In fact, I've had a number of people ask me today, well, what's going on in the market? What does this mean for the economy? Um, is this, you know, the beginning of the end? Is this expansion finally coming to a close? Um, and it's funny because it's worth noting that the Great Recession did not start in August of 2008. It started in December of 2007, folks. Now, mind you, that start point was determined by the MBER, and they tend to do it a couple years afterwards. But even, I remember, in July of that year, I was debating other economists about whether or not we were actually in a recession. Now, for me, making that call, looking back on things, it was pretty obvious. In fact, we got to remember that recessions just don't occur. They occur for a reason. There's some reason that the economy goes into this period of time that we call a recession. It's driven by a large negative shock to the system, a shock that has to be, like I said, large, it has to be rapid, and it has to be sustained. Looking for a recession is really looking for where that shock could come from. And the best place to look is major imbalances inside your economy. Well, back in 2006, the writing was on the wall. We had enormous balances in our economy. The big three, housing, finance, and the consumer. Housing, 
Not only was, of course, there a major bubble going on, the accumulation of tons of bad mortgage debt, but also the nation was vastly overbuilding its housing supply. On the finance side, of course, all that mortgage debt was being packaged up and sold off to unsuspecting investors by the investment banks, including Lehman Brothers. And it's also worth noting, it wasn't just that Lehman Brothers was selling off bad debt to unsuspecting investors. They themselves had leveraged up. They themselves had taken their outsized profits, driven off really what, in hindsight, looks a lot like fraud. And uh, uh, they, they made those profits even larger by, by borrowing a bunch of money themselves. And then, of course, last but not least, there was you and me, the American consumer, people who felt rich because their home was worth so much, and they could, their cat could get a mortgage loan, for God's sake, right? And everybody was out spending that money, and savings rates dropped, and the trade deficit. But the imbalance, as good as we felt in 2006, if you were willing to look at the data, it was pretty clear we were running very rapidly off a very short period. It was only a matter of when, not if. Now, Lehman Brothers was, if you will, the final step in the downturn, if you will. It was the last big shock, as everything else had already broken. Consumers were spending less. The housing market was in free fall. It finally caught up with the stock market in the middle of 2008. And that was a point in time where, as a nation, we went from total denial past reality, right to complete and utter hysteria. Now, in many ways, we're still hysterical. <laughs> it's so intriguing, looking back over the last decade since then, you look at the underlying numbers, and then you look at the headlines. American middle class hasn't gotten a raise in 15 years. Millennials poorer than previous generations. We're measuring the economy all wrong. We're, we're still in the midst of the financial crisis, the age of secular stagnation. I've talked about this in the past in previous events. I line this up, and I call it miserabilism. <laughs> miserabilism, the philosophy of pessimism, desperately trying to convince people things are worse than they actually are. Folks, the economy is great. And this isn't new, by the way. I, I know it's, it's a new era, and we got a new administration, and they love to tell you how good things are. But really, meet the Trump economy, same as the old economy. Ten years of steady growth. Right now, things are about as healthy as they could be. I mean, last year, 2017, was a great year, 2.5% uh, growth. At the end of the year last year, for reasons a little unclear to me, we had a fiscal stimulus plan put, in, put into, into place. Now, fiscal stimulus gives a little boost to the economy. So we have all the momentum plus that little boost, and the numbers are clear. Overall growth continues to be great. I'm going to get in some of those numbers in just a second. Labor markets are good. Business investment is good. Wages, exports, energy, housing, all in good trends. Chance of a recession over the next 24 months still very, very small. Very small. And, of course, California still out in front, still leading the charge. So many good things going on out there, even in the midst of this constant drip, drip, drip of bad news in the headlines, including, of course, today's sell-off in the stock market. Now, of course, the Wall Street Journal next recession poll just came out, and, you know, my optimism about no recession in the next couple of years, well, the Wall Street Journal disagrees. Their panel of economists, almost 60 percent, said the next recession's got to be in 2020, folks. You heard it here first. Well, no, not quite first, because the Wall Street Journal did this about three months ago. But I do love this poll because, you know, last year they did the Wall Street Journal Next Recession poll, and the next recession la that last year was going to be in 2019. And, and in 2016 they did the next recession poll, and then, then it said the next recession was going to be in, work with me, 2018. You got it, right? Okay? So it's always two years away. Eventually we're going to have a recession. The Wall Street Journal is going to go, see, we were right. But the key here, of course, is this is not even a, it's not even, it's not even a realistic question. You know, I actually got sent a similar survey where they said, hey, would you fill it out? When do you think the next recession is going to be? And I said back, this is a stupid question. The question isn't when we're going to have a next recession, it's why. Until you have a why, there's no point in even thinking about when. If you don't have a why, this expansion will go on and on and on and on. So what is the why? That's the big question. And we don't have a why yet, from my perspective. Now, it doesn't mean everything's great. There's all sorts of break problems in the economy. Labor shortages are having a problem. Local housing shortages are intense. We have this market volatility, rising long-term rates. You got this aggressive Fed. You hear yesterday the president called the Fed crazy for what they've been doing. Sharp growth in government deficits, global trade and security worries. And of course, the worst thing of all is this crazy political atmosphere we're in. 
Every time I get around, the, the rhetoric, the, the vile, the poison in D.C. just gets worse. And this Kavanaugh hearing was just crazy. I mean, just, just watching it play out. And you realize the depth of the rot in D.C. right now, it's very scary. They're running around, howling at each other, inventing problems that don't exist, lobbing out solutions that are only good for small special interest groups. And in the meantime, they're ignoring the very real long-term problems our nation fails, uh, our, our, our needs to deal with. Underinvestment in infrastructure, rising wealth inequality, healthcare cost inflation, pension entitlement reform, on and on. Just this complete disconnect between what we should be talking about versus what we actually are talking about. And that's scary. And, you know, this is a nonpartisan comment because both sides are doing it. 30 years ago, I like to say that as a nation, we agreed on what the problems were, but we disagreed on the solutions. We came at it from different angles. Today it's gotten so bad, we can't even agree what the problems are. So one of my folks found this cartoon. Well, that was Brad with the Democratic weather. Now here's Tammy with the Republican weather. No, it doesn't work like that. You gotta have honest conversations about the economy, and that's what we're gonna try to do today. So get right into it, GDP growth. Great number, 4.2% growth in the second quarter of this year, almost back to 3% growth year on year. By the way, no, this is not unique. We saw a similar growth surge back in 2014 before we had the commodity bump. So things are heading forward in a nice steady basis. Uh, Q3 looks to be about 4%, another solid quarter. Looks like we're gonna end up in the 3.5% growth for this year, which of course is predicated on the 2.5% we were in, plus this big boost coming from the fiscal stimulus. Of where the spending came from, three big things happening right now. Consumer spending is really pushing the economy forward. At a week first quarter, they added 2.7% in the second quarter, probably a little about 2.3% in the third quarter. Consumers are doing great. Government spending, of course, is picking up. Sorry, I'm having some problems with remote control. Government spending is picking up as well, of course, because of the big spending package that was put into place at the end of last year. And of course, business investment. Someone help me out here on the computer. Can you get rid of my screen, please? Do we have a computer person back there? So how are you guys doing today? <laughs> Everybody well? Good, good, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, do we have anybody on the computer? Thank you, okay. Of course, fixed investment, also doing pretty well at this particular point in time. Well, let's start a little bit with the consumer, because the strong growth in the second quarter and a little bit of the third quarter is a catch-up after the very first week quarter. But overall, year-on-year -year spending is running in about the 26 to 2.7% range. And, you know, Americans are two-thirds of the U.S. economy. If the American consumer is healthy, the U.S. economy can plug, chug through a whole bunch of problems, and they are healthy. Take, for example, debt-to-income ratios. Still quite low at this particular point in time after the big deleveraging going on. You know, last year I was a little worried about savings rate. Well, at the beginning of this year, we had some GDP revisions. One of the big revisions was to income. The income numbers apparently were higher than they anticipated. And now the savings rate turns out it's been running about 7%, which is not only a heck of a lot better than the 2005, but it was even better than 2001. Very good numbers there, to say the least. A financial obligations ratio, the percent of household income necessary to uh, uh, pay your financial obligations still running of, uh, at a near record low level. Mortgage credit still relatively tight. The kind of quality borrower out there is very good compared to, again, even 2001. You look at various sorts of other credit markets, whether it's a newly delinquent, 30-day delinquent, nothing suggests any kind of problems out there. In fact, very solid markets there. Good, solid numbers. Housing, very similar sort of picture, about a six and a half, seven percent year in year growth in home prices. Month supply of home are still very tight, almost record tight, about four months supply. Now, a little bit of a slowdown in sales recently, a little bit of slowdowns in sales, not surprising since interest rates have been drifting up. And as a result of that, the inventory went from a record low level of 3.7 months to about four months, but still way down there, right? Now, what was the headline that came out of the, the recently about the housing market? I love this. Housing market showing signs of cracking. Ah! Really? I mean, this is the craziness you see in the press on a day-to-day -day basis. It's so out of touch with the underlying numbers. This is an incredibly healthy market, not just from a mortgage debt perspective, not just from a price perspective, but even from a construction standpoint. A lot of folks are out there wringing their hands and, and worried about the fact that, that housing starts are, are seemingly stuck at this 1.2 million. But you gotta remember, 
population growth is pretty slow right now. How many house, new housing units do we actually need per year? You know, back in the middle part of last decade when they were building tons of homes, you were talking over two million, but relative to population growth, we had vastly more housing starts than we did new households to fill them up. When the Great Recession hit, we had this huge excess supply. 1.2 million units is just about right. It's the Goldilocks zone. It's exactly what we're supposed to be building. There's nothing to worry about in that particular number. Housing is doing exactly what housing should be doing right now, and we should be glad for that. Ownership rates actually starting to drift up, and guess who's buying new homes? Younger folks, people under the age of, of, uh, of 45 are actually starting to buy. So the millennials are actually kicking in, finally starting to buy homes. Good news there on that particular front. I know, I'm sorry, guys, I, this remote control is giving me conniptions. Can we go back to where we were? Uh, can you forward me a little bit? <laughs> Keep going. Yeah, yeah, go more. Sorry. Keep going. <laughs> I'll tell you when to stop. Uh, one more. Keep going. Good. Good. Keep going. I got a lot of animation. My apologies. Here we go. Almost there. And... One more, one more. Beautiful, stop right there. All right, even interest rates. Yes, interest rates are dropping up. You know, what set off the panic here, of course, is that mortgage rates briefly touch 5% before they drop back down again. But remember, once you account for incomes and low interest rates, housing is still actually relatively affordable in the US economy. It's not overpriced by any stretch of the imagination. So even here, there's not any major stress out there on the economy. Labor markets, of course, continue to chug forward. A Little bit of growth in overall supply, about 1.7%. Hot markets right now, mining on fire. Lots of new oil production up 9%. Construction growing 4%. Logistics nationally up 3.3%. Administrative professional. Good solid numbers here across the board in terms of growth. Biggest problem in the labor markets today, despite the fact that we continue to talk about jobs, it's a lack of workers. Right now, the job openings rate in the U.S. economy is about 4.3 percent. You put that in context, the unemployment rate is 3.9 percent. If every person looking for a job took one of those job openings, we would still have leftover job openings. Since they started this survey 20 years ago, we've never seen this. We have a massive housing shortage, and of course, one of the results of that is wages are rising. This again gets into one of those constant nonsensical drip drip negative headlines. Americans haven't gotten wages forever. Of course they have. Now the data you see in the month to month labor statistics, it doesn't paint a very good picture because the data has problems. Understand your data. That's the first thing I tell my, my economists when they're doing anything. When you're looking at the numbers, how are they made? What is the sample? What are the issues with the data? The data coming out of the BLS on a month to month basis is not inflation adjusted. It has some top coding problems. It doesn't adjust for the fact that high paid boomers are retiring in mass right now. Once you correct for all that, you get some da better data. You can get that from the Atlanta Fed. It's called the Wage Tracker. And that shows average wages growing 3.5%, median wages growing about 2% in real terms. These are good, solid numbers. And even these numbers, to be honest with you, underrepresent things. Here's one of my favorite stupid statistics. Re real median income for males. People talk about this all the time. And you, you can download this data from the census. And it does tell a disturbing picture. Male, me, real, in real terms, according to the data, median incomes for a male worker in the U.S. economy hit $40,000 in 1973, and today it's $41,000. The suggestion here, just stop for a second and think about this. Wow, the average American male worker has seen no increase in the quality of their life for over 45 years. Now, does that even smell right? Does that seem right in any way, shape, or form? And the answer, oopsie. Ah, that's not very nice. What do you got here? All right. Jeez. Okay. Having all sorts of technical difficulties up here today. <laughs> Problem here, of course, is that doesn't make any sense at all. And it doesn't because, you know, you got to remember inflation numbers, they're very good at measuring price changes in what we call the market economy. But as a measure of quality of life, they're horrible. 
You can't look at this data and think it's real in any straight. Take, take some of these statistics. In 1973, the average life expectancy for a male was 67 years. Today, it's 76 years. Nowhere is that counted in quality of life numbers. Infant mortality is 1.75%. Today it's 0.5%. That's not included in any of those numbers. Crime rates, 4.15% down to 2.8%. By the way, if you look at violent crime rates, despite all the shootings, violent crime rates are down even more. There's been enormous increases in quality of life. Here's some other ways life is better today. I mean, think of this. Here's a cell phone today, okay? Here's a cell phone in 1973. <laughs> if I could get like, the, the smell of urine to just kind of wash over you, it, it would just work that much better, you know what I mean? Sorry about that, but you know what I'm saying, yeah, if any remember. Here's an entry-level car today. Here's an entry-level car in 1973. Enough said, you know what I mean? Here, here, here's a television today. You could just go for a couple hundred bucks. Here's a high-end television in 1973. And look, look, look at that wonderful remote control on there, right? Uh, here, here's, um, here's online shopping today. Here's online shopping in 1973. Here's a, here's a dictionary today. Here's a dictionary in 1973. Remember Funk and Wagner, one, one month, one book, right? Uh, you know, what, what else is there? Um, here's John Travolta today. Here's John Travolta in 1973. All right, we'll give 1970 that to 1973, right? But everything else is better, right? It just it doesn't make any sense. It's just it's funny. Now you say, well, what about inequality? But even here, you got to remember, inequality as as we're measuring it at some level is inequality based on some of these gross income numbers, which aren't very good. If you look at after taxes and transfers, it turns out inequality is not growing as rapidly as we once thought, and in fact is much lower once you look at the numbers in an appropriate way. Income inequality isn't that big of a deal, despite all the emphasis. You know, what is a big deal on it is, of course, wealth inequality. That's what you should be panicked. Right now, according to the 2016 numbers, the top 1% of Americans own 40% of all wealth in the U.S. This is a massive problem. But no one's talking about this. We're too busy running around talking about $15 an hour minimum wages at the national level. That's not going to fix this problem. You've got to have whole sets of, of, of changes in our tax system to fix this problem, which is the real problem. And where's all this new wealth occurring? Everybody keeps talking about how bad the millennials have it. Millennials are okay. On average, your average millennial has the same wealth today as someone of that age group did back in 1989. The real winners is not just the top 1%, but it's all the retired folks. Look at the massive, in, the, the, the average wealth for people 65 to 75 has doubled since 1989. For 75 and above, has doubled since 1989. Boomers are retiring with more money than ever before, which begs the question, why every time we turn around do the boomers ask for more handouts for their retirement years? Robert, Robert will tell us that when he comes up after here. Robert's our, our in-house boomer. He'll be explaining himself. Which, of course, brings me to Prop 5, because there's a lot of propositions on this year's ballot. Uh, Prop 5, of course, allows for the expansion of Prop 13. It's now, you know, if you stay in your house, your property taxes never change. What a wonderful gift for boomers in their latter years of their life who bought their home 20, 30 years ago, who are paying 10% of taxes of the people around them. But now, now, if Prop 5 passes, you're going to be able to take that tax benefit and move it from county to county. Now, the argument here is this is going to help the housing supply problem, which makes no sense whatsoever. Moving pieces around the board doesn't increase the number of pieces, folks. But what it does do is it extends a benefit for boomers in the world where boomers already have so many benefits coming to them. I will let you decide what you want to vote on this proposition. But for me, it's like, come on, enough is enough. Let's move on. The big problem, of course, is workforce growth, or lack thereof, about less than 1% right now. Participation rates overall haven't started to rise. But again, this is a demographic issue. Remember, it all boils down to the boomers yet again. Boomers are the center of so much happening in our economy today. And what's most important about boomers is to understand kind of demographic history. Here's how it worked. Every boomer was raised, this is very scientific, every boomer was raised in a household of approximately 17.2 kids. Their parents had no idea what their name was. As a result of that, 
They were so traumatized, all boomers went out and had 1.3 kids, which they excessively overparented, thus giving us the millennials. <laughs> now, from a psychological standpoint, we see how that works, but from a demographic standpoint, what it means is our population pyramid turned very rapidly into a population column. Millennials are the biggest generation, but they're only the biggest in as much as they're about 2% to 3% larger than the boomers. What that means, of course, is now that the boomers are starting to retire, you have basically very few people moving into the workforce to take those positions. And the growth of people 25 to 54 in their prime working years, that has been basically zero for the last seven or eight years. We have a giant worker shortage in this nation, which is why last year, of course, the, Federal, uh, the, 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 uh, the uh, Congressional Budget Office put out a survey and said, how do you make the economy grow faster? And they said, hey, what you got to do is increase immigration for more workers to move here. Increase immigration. Now, the debate over immigration is, 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 is furious in D.C. at this particular point in time. And if you want to debate how we lend immigrants to this nation, how they should come, the skills, is it family, is it over the border, is it on planes, is it legal, is it not legal, that's all fine. As long as in the end, we agree more immigrants. But in the end, we're going the opposite direction. We're shrinking the number of immigrants. We're trying to push people actively out of this country, and that is intensifying the labor shortage problem. Understand that immigrants are a solution, not a problem. And unfortunately, you're not getting that out of a lot of people in the United States. They don't see that the way we do. In California, it's probably not a surprise. A, a third of the people in this state were born overseas. For us, immigration is part of the landscape. But other parts of the United States, they don't agree with that. Now, another part of this, of course, was about reform. Oh, my God. One more time, folks. The other part of this, of course, was about reforming the income tax goes and reducing deficits. Now, this goes back, of course, to the big tax plan that went into place last year. And as you know, we didn't get tax cut, we didn't get reduced deficits, nor did we get tax reform. What is the difference between tax reform and tax cuts? What well, all boils down to the difference is just bringing down the top level versus getting rid of loopholes. Because in a democracy, over time, this the forces of democracy push us to a point where special interests, particularly well-heeled special interests, are constantly lobbying and pushing for special provisions for them. And over time, the tax code becomes very unfair. Small groups of people with special perks and privileges pay less and less, and as a result of that, to pay for the basic services government provides, they have to put higher taxes on everybody else. Now, we fixed this in the past. In the Kennedy administration, there was a huge tax overhaul. Reagan and Tip O'Neill did a huge tax overhaul in the 80s, and it's been seen to have positive impact on the economy. We didn't have that overhaul. Take the corporate tax rate. I agree, 35% was way too high, but the actual tax rate was 21% because many companies had huge loopholes. None of those loopholes were, were, were taken away. We just cut the ta tax rates, and then of course at the back end of that, we c increased overall spending. And as a result of that, we now have a deficit-led fiscal stimulus program. In a late expansion, full employment economy, we are using a fiscal stimulus package. Again, it kind of boggles the mind from any macro standpoint that we are doing this, but it's done. And you can see the numbers. First two quarters of the year, we're running well over a trillion dollars in borrowing. By the end of the year, probably 1.2 trillion in new federal debt. Compare that to the last few years where it was about 700 trillion. So you're talking, I'm sorry, 700 billion. So you're talking somewhere on the order of an increase of about 40%. And this is, of course, in the face, yet again, of the retiring boomer generation. Right now, there are 46 million retired people in the United States. Because of boomers retiring, that's going to go from 46 to 77 million people in the next 20 years. That's going to take the share of spending on, on Medicare from 18 to 19% of federal revenues today, 19% today, to well over 40% in 20 years. We have a massive fiscal crisis coming down the pike at us, and we've seen fit simply to turn around and expand the deficit today as opposed to dealing with the long-term challenges. Now, is this an immediate crisis? The answer is no. Because again, we've gone from about 10 trillion in new debt over the next day, decade to 13 trillion. We've gone from increasing, say, net debt to GDP, right now it's 70%, at the end of the decade it'll be about 90%. So immediate crisis, no. Long-term crisis, enormous, and we're not even talking about it. 
But remember, fiscal stimulus, it feels good today, it's borrowing from the future. We're intensifying those future problems, something we all need to pay attention to, which of course brings me to trade. Because you know, it's interesting, Tra the trade deficit has absolutely been widening, but this is a direct consequence of that fiscal stimulus package. You gotta understand, a trade deficit is the gap between what a nation produces and what a nation consumes. If we are consuming more than we're producing, that additional consumption has to come from somewhere else. It comes from the rest of the world. And of course, that has to do with a lack of savings here inside the United States. You can see that clearly on the right-hand side. Over the long run, net national savings has been falling, and it, with, along with that has been the trade deficit. If you want to get the trade deficit closed, you have to reduce consumption and increase production. That is how you get it to close. Now, we're not doing that. Quite the opposite. The fiscal stimulus package, spending more, taxing less, is encouraging excessive consumption. The fiscal stimulus package is causing the trade deficit to widen. But of course, that's not the administration's word on this. The administration says this has nothing to do with their fiscal policies. It has everything to do with foreign trade barriers. And of course, early this year, they started out fixing this by slapping a 25% tariff on imports of steel. Now, I got to tell you, as far as tariff policies goes, this one was mind-numbingly stupid. I could not in any way, shape, or form justify this move. Why steel? Well, we've got to close the trade deficit. Steel imports are less than 1% of imports. You're not going to move the needle. Well, it's because the steel industry is so hard hit. Actually, prices are up, production's up, profits are up. Steel industry's doing great. They've clawed back market share from foreign producers. A couple of years ago, high watermark for foreign producers. One third of steel consumed in the United States was produced outside our nation. Now that's down to about 28%. So steel industry is doing great. Well, it's about bringing back steel jobs. We know we need those steel jobs. Really? The entire metals industry in the United States hires less than 100,000 people. The entire industry. If you banned imports of steel and aluminum, you know what? You're going to create 3,000 jobs. Do you know how many jobs we created last month? 200,000. I'm sorry, two months ago, 200,000. Last month it was 140,000. 3,000 jobs is nothing. Statistical margin of error. Why steal? Well, of course, the answer there is because trade wars are good and easy to win. Now, money, did anybody catch what the, what the EU responded to this? No, oh, well, they said, well, actually, we can also do stupid. <laughs> because you know, you don't operate in a vacuum. And Europe responded, quite understandably, by putting all sorts of tariffs on U.S. goods and hurting U.S. producers. Then, of course, we spun around and had a nice new trade pact with, with Europe. We're going to sit down and, and talk about fixing our, our trade relationships, having a new trade deal with them. I'm glad we're doing this. But to be clear, we've just went back to the transatlantic trade partnership. You remember in the election how bad that was, how toxic it was to America? Well, now we're doing it again. And as far as that goes, it's also relatively good news that NAFTA seems to have been settled. We're not going to pull out of NAFTA. We, they've done a few tweaks here and there, but for the most part, 95% of NAFTA is remaining in place. And I am thrilled about this. Again, rebranding it, calling it the best thing ever, it's the same old NAFTA. I'm glad it's done with, but it's just rebranded. Time to move on. This settles things. The only thing that's out there on the horizon, of course, is the conversation with China. And here, I have a lot more sympathy for this administration. The Chinese have not been playing fair in the global sandbox. We know that. And from everything from protection of intellectual property rights to all sorts of non-tariff barriers to really, really tough restrictions on investment in China, everything suggests that they just have not lived up to the expectations that they, what they were going to live up to when they entered the WTO. And it's about time someone stood up and said, hey, this has got to come to an end. Now, the problem here is the primary ask of the, of the administration is that the Chinese closed a trade deficit with the United States by $200 billion. Now go back to what I said a little while ago. Yes, we run a huge trade deficit with China. That is mainly an internal problem. That's not an external problem. The issues we need to discuss with China do not wrap around that trade deficit. And for all the control that China has on their trade, so we say, uh, world, they don't have a giant lever in Beijing that says trade deficit with the US. And they just kind of pull it this way and everything closes. Does it work like that? So we are asking sort of unrealistic things. Now the big question here 
is how bad is this going to be for the U.S.? It's not about U.S. exports. What we export to China is relatively thin and has small sort of supply trades. Everybody keeps talking about the soy farmers, the, the 0.001% of the U.S. economy called soy farming. It's not relevant. The real relevant part of this, of course, is exports because 20% of all imports in the United States come from China in the manufacturing sphere. That's an enormous part of the supply chain. Now, that is going to create some problems, but I think we'll find a solution. And here's the number one reason why. 0.75% of our economy goes to China on an annual basis. 4% of our, their economy comes to us. So in the end, they have a lot more to suffer from trade disruptions. And here's the other part of it that's kind of interesting. Uh, have you been paying attention to the yuan dollar exchange rate? Because while there's a 25% tariff going on all these goods, at the same time, guess what? The yuan just depreciated by about 12 to 13%. So we're not paying all the tariff. A lot of this is being a hit being taken by Chinese producers. So in the end, the Chinese are actually suffering far more from this than we are, and I'm hopeful to see that we can get to the negotiating table and get through this over the course of the next six to eight months. It is not a shock big enough to cause a recession, but if it gets really nasty, look for a little bit of a slowdown for 2019. Manufacturing and exports in the meantime continue to rise despite all the issues uh, overall right through July uh, and manufacturing growing about 3%. Exports continue to rise as well. Seemingly we're, we're moving through this. Oil production continues to boom, record high levels, drilling activity. Um, you haven't seen it at the pump yet because prices are still relatively high. But that's not because of the supply issues. You know, the, while West Texas, West Texas intermediate prices are up, at the same time a couple of years ago they found this 20 billion barrels of oil sitting out there in West Texas. The reason it hasn't hit the markets is they're trying to get the pipelines put into place. But when it gets hit, put into place, you're going to see a new flood of oil on the market, and that should, in theory, start pushing those prices back down again. So this little lump you're seeing at the pump, forget about it, which is why Prop 6, come on, folks, Prop 6 repealing the gas tax, really? Gas prices aren't that high. We're not that sensitive to the gas prices, and we desperately need our roads fixed. To do this right now, just seems completely irresponsible to me. Keep the gas tax, please. We need this. And remember, prices will come down when those pipes get up and running. So just, just wait for it. We're going to be OK on this. Non-res construction, we have folks here from, from, uh, 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 from the industry to come tell us about it. But again, the numbers are good here as well, particularly in the mining exploration, up 36% because of all the new construction. Things have slowed down on the transaction side of things, but that's because one of the impacts of the, Im of the issues with China is China's pulled all their money out. China was investing billions and billions of dollars in the U.S., and that money is, is leaving rapidly, and it's slowing things down. But again, the underlying dynamics of the industry are just fine. In fact, in some ways, maybe taking some of the Chinese money out will calm things down and make the market a little bit more rational. So I'm pretty happy about this particular change in things. As for lending, uh, again, the banks seem to be a little bit more comfortable on this. Uh, I know costs have come up just a little bit, but not quite as dramatic as people would have, would have you believe. In fact, more than anything else, uh, when you're seeing some construction projects that are getting hit, it's because for some reason those developers weren't planning on an increase in costs. The costs are there, you're going to have to rework it, but the underlying dynamics in the, in, the, in the commercial industry are just fine. And that brings me, of course, to the stock market itself. The stock market, of course, a big sell-off. Why? And of course the answer is global markets, uh, a fear of trade wars, fear of interest rate fears. Well, yes, interest rates are up, folks, but I mean, look where they are. Mortgage rates barely touch 5%. From any long-term standpoint, interest rates are still very low. There's nothing scary here. Well, what about the Federal Reserve and, and what about inflation? Well, look, we had a little surge in inflation that's already fading away, but that was obvious. Look, why would we have inflation? One of the arguments is, well, it's because unemployment rates are low. Well, the unemployment inflation effect, that's a 1970s thing. That happened back when underlying inflation was intense. Over the last 20 years, when underlying forces of, of inflation were not intense, when we've had price control, there's very little unemployment impact. I don't even know why this is still a conversation in the press or candidly in academia. Unemployment has very little impact in inflation when, un, when, it, when core inflation rates are low. Why are core inflation rates low? Because bank lending is relatively weak and M2 growth is relatively weak as well. That is why they're relatively low. There's no reason to fear in any way, shape, or form inflation, which of course begs the question, why is the Federal Reserve raising rates? 
And here again, it's funny how, how you come full circle on this stuff. Yesterday, Trump criticized the Fed. Now, that's very unusual for a president to do that. Um, and what's intriguing about it, of course, he was criticizing the Fed because he's blaming the Fed for the stock market decline and the increase in long-term rates. But you remember, long-term rates are drifting up not because of the Fed. The actual impact of, of short-term rates and long-term rates is very small. Uh, it passed through is about 1 to 6 or 1 to 7. This is not why long-term rates are going up. Long-term rates are going up because, because the government's borrowing more and because the economy's hot, because of the fiscal stimulus plan. In other words, long-term rates are rising for the same reason the trade deficit's widening. It's all part and parcel. It's not because of the Federal Reserve. Now, why is the Federal Reserve doing what they're doing? I don't know. Normalizing, that's what I like to hear that, which, you know, you look at the 30 years of interest rates, what's normal in there? Really, the Fed's been tightening, and the only thing they're doing is collapsing the yield curve, which is not healthy for the U.S. economy. That's not normal by any stretch of the imagination. I'm a little relieved long-term rates are coming up because it's going to widen that yield curve, take a little pressure off the economy, and if the Fed stays here, we're going to be just fine. Are they worried about another stock market bubble? You know, look, folks, people talk all the time, is a stock market bubble, is not stock, not stock market bubble? The Federal Reserve shouldn't care about stock market bubbles because their mandate is price stability and economic stability, and for the record, the stock market has no impact on economic stability or price stability. So it shouldn't even be part of the conversation. And if they're worried about a stock market bubble, why are they talking about making life easier for the big investment banks? This to me is, is absolutely crazy. Yes, the small banks, the community banks, the local banks, they need the burden of, of Dodd-Franks lifted off them. It's crazy what the, what the small banks had to deal with for having to do with a crisis they had very little to do with in the first place. The big banks, on the other hand, the ones are talking about deregulating, uh, let's be clear, the last two recessions started in South Manhattan, folks. The dot-com disaster and, of course, the, uh, um, <laughs> the subprime disaster. Both of those started in the minds of folks who work out of South Manhattan. Financial innovation is code word in Manhattan for how Wall Street is going to screw you next, okay? So the idea of deregulating those guys, that does scare me a little. That does scare me a little. So we'll see. We'll see how this shakes out. How about locally? What's going on here? I love this. How does your state not excel? We have the most smog. Uh, 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 Vegas, uh, Nevada gets the lowest annual rainfall. Oklahoma's tough, man. They eat fewest fruits and veggies. It's a tough place in Oklahoma. So what is going on locally? Well, again, actually, the, the labor shortages across the nation, the lowest unemployment rates are actually in the center part of the nation. The unemployment rate in Iowa right now is 2.4%. And the reason for that, of course, is because people are moving. They're moving out of Iowa. They're moving out of the Midwest. They're moving to places like Florida, Nevada, Colorado. Here's the most recent numbers. This is over the last year. And look, and look at the huge numbers. People moving to Oregon. They're moving to Idaho, Nevada, Arizona, South Carolina. Huge inflows. California, negative. People are moving out. So bringing it home to California, what's going on here? I, I like it. California, biggest, fifth biggest economy in the, in the world. Um, biggest economy in the United States, largest population. The biggest county, San Bernardino, my po populous county, Los Angeles. Highest mountain, Whitney. Lowest point, Death Valley, home of most billionaires. And of course, home of the toughest former governor. <laughs> Quite a state. And you think through what's going on across our region, wherever you're looking at, and the answer is, things are good. Yes, things have been a little volatile, but you know, you can see we've had bigger rises and bigger drops over the course of the last 20, 30 years. We've been a hypercyclical state, but every time we come out of it, we're growing faster in the United States, and there's no difference right now. Over the last few years, the U.S. has been growing, California's been growing substantially faster than the U.S. You can certainly see it here over the right-hand side. Uh, well, overall, 3% real growth in the economy. And this is acceleration that didn't start in the wake of the Great Recession. It's really started over the course of the last few years. Uh, of job growth right now, a solid 2.1%, still faster than the U.S., 350,000 jobs with high growth in construction, education, logistics, professional, healthcare, lots of solid numbers there. Last five years, eighth fastest growing economy in the nation, great numbers across the board. But it's all in the Bay Area. You know, uh, one of my uh, favorite uh, 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 sort of commentators, Joel Cocken on at Chapman, you know, he said not too long ago, well, it looks good, sure, fifth largest economy, but all income and high-end job growth took place in Silicon Valley. Not quite. Yes, a lot of high-end job growth, almost a half a million new job, full-time jobs in the state paying over 100,000, 
40% in the Bay Area, 40% in coastal Southern California, and the other 20% across the region. Lots of new high-end jobs forming across the state. Very good numbers. And you know, we just got the American Community Survey data. Uh, oh, sorry. And of course, where the job growth over the last 20 years? Again, it's not the Bay Area. 40% uh, oh, of all job growth in California over the last 20 years, 40% in three counties, LA, San Bernardino, and Riverside. Everybody talks about the Bay Area. The true center of gravity in the state of California is centered right here in the Inland Empire right now. Median incomes are rising, the 2017 numbers show solid growth across the region. Yes, some of the biggest numbers are in San Jose and San Francisco, but San Diego, Sacramento, Los Angeles, the Inland Empire, all showing double digit signs over the last couple of years as well. Health insurance programs still look better than ever. Uh, exports are up this particular year. Ports are doing just fine despite some of those trade disruptions. Lots of good numbers here. Taxable sales are starting to increase yet again, particularly, yes, in the building and construction industry having to do with the non, a lot of new non-residential construction. And the non-permit values, again, 2018 is looking to be another record year. Better numbers for office, better numbers for hotel, industrial continues to move forward. Lots of good numbers here. Of course, bringing this local, Robert's going to be up here in just a minute. Income taxes, well, you're going to have a new governor. You have a new governor starting next year, and this governor is going to come in at a, with a wonderful, wonderful budget to play with. Huge, every year we're having way more than the, the Department of Finance is expecting, and figuring out what to do with that money has been one of the most fun hobbies in Sacramento right now. But remember, the personal income tax is now almost 70% of all general funds because of Prop 30 and Prop 50. It's a highly progressive tax system, and because it's highly progressive, it's highly volatile. Every time you turn around, Jerry Brown keeps talking about a next recession. He's not saying that because he thinks there's going to be another recession. He's saying it because he knows when we do have another recession, even if it's mild, we're going to see a disaster, a fiscal disaster in Sacramento. So keep an eye out for it. Feels good now, but the next time around, it's going to be a big problem. Now, there has been a slowdown in job growth. While 2% is still better in the nation, it's weaker than the 3% we saw before. And of course, this is not a function of any problems in the economy. It's a function of a lack of labor supply. You look at the numbers, unemployment in the state of California is at a record low level. Unemployment in South, South, Southern California is at a record low level. Never have there been so few people out there looking for jobs in the midst of a really highly competitive labor market. Typically, this would bring people into the state, but not this time. Total net migration, including international, is about 2.5, about 0.25%, and this, of course, goes back to housing and housing prices. Prices continue to go up. It's not a bubble. Look at the mortgage numbers. Look at the pace of building. It's not a bubble. This is not 2007. This is a true housing shortage, and we know that just by looking at the numbers. To maintain 2% job growth in this state, you need 210 to 260,000 building permits per year. Right now, we're running 120 to 125,000, half of what we need. Which brings me to a few more propositions out there. And oh, by the way, something else I want to talk about in terms of demographic time bombs. You know, this is some forecast by age from 2010 to 2015 for the state. And over here on the right is the support ratio, the ratio of retired to, of course, uh, uh, working age people. And you can see the huge explosion in retired people in this state. And remember, retired people live in homes too. You think the housing shortage has having an impact on labor markets now. Wait five to six years when all these boomers leave the labor market but don't move out of their house. So the housing crunch is gonna become even more intense again as a result of this demographic bulge moving into retirement. Now we have had some things done, SB 35, SB 828 have been some positive moves. SB 35 says if a local community is not compliant with arena standards, then you can go ahead and move around local control. We see this playing out up in Cupertino where Valco is suing, basically not suing, but they've applied to the state to move around local regulators who've been forestalling the redevelopment of that, of that collapsed mall for a decade now. They want to move beyond local control, build it because of SB 35. SB 828 makes those arena standards that much more stiffer. Again, all good. Now, what else? Well, one of the propositions is the affordable housing bond. Now, listen, I got no problem with affordable housing. I understand that. But you got to remember, we're short 100,000 units per year. The government will never, ever, ever be able to make up that supply with government-subsidized construction. It can never happen. There's not enough money. 
So I'm sure this is going to pass. It's well-meaning. It doesn't move the needle. You've got to free up the local markets to deal with that, and we're just not doing that. Now, one of the bits of good news here is one of the upsides of labor shortages is wages are going up in the state. They're going up the fastest for low-skilled workers because they're in tightest supply. And over here, our median wage growth, look at the West, which is California, compared to the U.S. overall. Wages growing faster here in the state than almost any place else. Very good news. And one result of that is affordability is getting a little better. When you look at the share of households that are rent-constrained, it's been falling over the last few years. Stop talking about affordability. It's not the issue, it's a supply issue, which of course brings me to Prop 10. Prop 10, of course, gets rid of cost to Hawkins, which would allow more aggressive forms of rent control. Folks, it's not an affordability conversation. And overall, it's a supply conversation. Keeping rents down tells the market to build less, not more. It's the wrong direction to go. And by the way, for anybody who thinks that rent control helps low-income families, forget about it. Rent control actually hurts low-income families. Why? Because it encourages middle-income families to live in older housing units because it's such a screaming deal. And if you look at places in Santa Monica, if you look at places in Berkeley with some of the most rigid rent control in the state, guess what? It's not low-income families who are taking advantage of that rent control. It's middle-income families. There's a person I know, he and his wife lived in a, in a two-bedroom kind of low-end apartment in Los Angeles for a decade because it was such a screaming deal. When they finally moved out of that apartment, they went and bought themselves a $1.1 million home. Who are we trying to help? If you want to help low-income people, this is not the way to do it. It's just not a functional way of doing it. So, the real problem is incentives. You really want to fix housing, make it so that local governments benefit from housing. Not too long ago, uh, a city of El Segundo uh, by, the, by the LAX said, we can't handle more housing. And they were honest. They said, I can't take more housing. My budget's a mess. Housing contributes 15% to my revenues. My residents account for 80% of my costs. I can't survive with more housing. And I appreciate that view, they're right. Now mind you, if every city says this, which they do, no one builds housing, how are we gonna have the businesses that do contribute to revenue? Who's gonna work there? Take a step back, figure out how to make it worthwhile for cities to have housing. One way is to get rid of Prop 13. Another way is to allocate tax revenues on the basis of population basis, not on the basis of where a big box store is. There are ways of doing this, but you've gotta have the broader conversation. We're not doing that, which is a little bit of worrisome. So, wrapping up, I think it took a little extra time here, um, but the positives, it's good. Um, GDP growth, 3% plus, straight revenues, great, labor market's tight, rising wages put pressure on profits, exports, business investment, great, inflation, interest rates, debt levels, everything's fine. And yes, I apologize for leaving Sonoma in there, it's, I did a talk up there not too long ago. But the negatives, of course, labor shortages, going to be a more and more acute issue for employers here in the Inland Empire, across the state, across the nation. The Fed, well, they're talking about maybe tightening more. We'll see if they'll finally back off. But man, I don't like the flattening yield curve, this crazy market volatility, the federal deficits widening, political uncertainties, critical policy uncertainties, and of course, last but not least, this sense of miserabilism that continues to influence us. We think we live in tough times. We don't. We've never had it so good. Stop. Let's face the real problems and stop pretending things are tough right now. They're not. They're not. The great disconnect, you know? We live in a world where our, our politicians and our policy leaders talk about the number of jobs. They should be worried about the number of workers. They talk about who pays for health care. They need to be worried about what we're paying for. They talk about tax levels. They should worry about tax structure. They talk about income inequality. They should worry about wealth inequality. We talk about funded government liabilities. We need to worry about unfunded government liabilities. We talk about business investment. We need to worry about a lack of public investment. We worry about inflation. We should worry about slow bank lending. We worry about the cost of California housing. We need to worry about the supply of California housing. You know, I, I learned one thing a long time ago. If you don't ask the right question, you're never going to get the right answer. And we live in a world where no one is asking the right question. And it, it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's scary. It's scary. So, you know, turn off the weapons of mass distraction. 
Put aside the Twitter, the screaming headlines. Look at the data. Look at the analysis. See what's really happening. Open your eyes and look. Things are pretty damn good. Now, there's one other proposition I got to weigh in on, folks. And that's Prop 7, the daylight savings. They want to get rid of it. This, and I, I kind of agree. The daylight savings is a problem because every year I, I, I get screwed up. I miss appointments. And it's a problem. On the other hand, I really like light into the evening. Don't you like getting home when it's light, having a couple hours of work in the yard? So I want to propose Prop 7A. Prop 7A says we get rid of daylight savings, but just move California straight to central time, just two hours ahead. What do you think, right? We all get up in the dark, but I mean, the sun's not going to set till 9 o'clock at night. I think this is brilliant. Come on, really? Work with me here. All right, anyway. Anyway, moving on. Thank you very much. And uh, with that, uh, we're going to move it on to our host.